George Harrison once said, everything else in life can wait, but the search for God cannot wait. As a Hare Krishna, he was still searching for God. In one of his most famous songs, he cried, I really want to see you, really want to be with you, really want to see you, Lord, but it takes so long, my Lord. When I first heard those words, I couldn't help but think of God's promise in Jeremiah 29 verse 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And George Harrison certainly seemed to be doing that. But in my research for a book I wrote called The Beatles, God and the Bible, I concluded that he didn't come to faith in Christ, that he died in his sins. But I may have got it wrong, and I couldn't be more delighted to know that I did get it wrong. Recently, I found this comment on our YouTube channel. The great racing driver Emerson Fittipoli was a Christian and a longtime friend of George. There's a video on YouTube where Fittipoli is giving his testimony to a Brazilian church, and around the halfway mark, he brings up his relationship with Harrison and tells the interviewing pastor that in his last dying days, he led George to Christ. When I read that, I was very skeptical. I had no idea who Emerson Fittipoli was, but I soon found out. He was a very popular Brazilian racing driver who had been world champion in 1972 and 1974, who had been involved in a terrible crash that almost killed him. And we are racing here. And Sonardi falls in. Look at Emerson Fittipaldi making a good move. And no, at the no, front of the battle, he's, he, touched, he touched into the wall. He touched Heavy Greg Moore. Crash. He touched Greg Moore right there. He just came down on him a little bit. Emerson Whoa. was really flying as he came through turn one. Devastating damage to that race car. And of course, we go back under yellow. So I began wondering if he really was a Christian. I found this. Well, the first thing I'm going to say to everyone is open your heart to Jesus, to God. Well, the first thing I'm going to say to everyone is open your heart to Jesus, to God. It seems that he was. So the next question I asked was, did he really know this famous Beatle? George Harrison went to Brazil in 1979 with the aim of filming a video for his new single, Faster, a song written for his friends in Formula One racing. George had increasingly been involved in racing since 1977 as a way of existing outside of the music industry. It was because of his love of Formula One racing that he met Emerson Fittipaldi. Here he is taking his photo. I then found this very old video of Fittipoli interviewing George at a beach. Well, what are your advice that you give to young musicians, someone who's starting to be music? Um, it's like anything, practice. Practice. But I, that's one thing I never do. Isso é uma coisa que ele nunca faz. <laughs> Praticar. <laughs> But that's, you know, to be better. How you see the the Beatle mania, all the the Beatle phenomenon, because it's yeah, it's like I don't know, it's um, something that happened. It just was like magic. It happened, and it was bigger than any of us thought. And uh, I don't know. Nobody can explain. Uh, if, if one day on the future get together again to play? I don't think so. Tell me, and the best way to explain that is to say, like when we all live together with our mother and father, and when you get older, you all leave and live with your wives. And you don't yeah, go back correct. to live with mom and mother and father. If you're happy yeah. the way you're living. Yeah, now. much happier. It was too too hectic. It was good for good for five years, six years, but for the you know, it drives you crazy. So he'd actually met George Harrison and he was an evangelistic Christian. But was this a one-time meeting or were they actually friends? In other words, did George Harrison respect Emerson Fittipoli enough to listen to him share the gospel? Then I found this.
pity party. Hello, Emma. You've been through a difficult time these last couple of months. Hello, Emma. So good to see you well again. So let's go to the beach. Drink 20 caipirinas each. Cause it's all right. Emerson, 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 Fitty Pally. Emerson, so nice to know you well. And I look forward to seeing you. Sorry I'm not in Brazil, but next time we're going on holiday, we have lots of caipirinos <laughs> and we'll have a nice good time. Okay, well, God bless you and everybody in England who loves you, all your friends and Olivia and Danny too, join me to say congratulations on a wonderful recovery and a great life and more to come. We miss you. And that left me saying, well, I may have got it wrong. By the way, way back in 1975, I produced a paper called Living Waters, which featured George Harrison. In it, I quoted one of his songs where he said, Give me hope, help me cope with this heavy load, trying to reach and touch you with heart and soul. Take hold of my hand that I might understand you. And then I asked for special prayer for George Harrison. Perhaps God heard our prayers. Now watch this. Do you like the Beatles? Oh, I love the Beatles. Do you think there's an afterlife? I have no idea. Do you ever think about it? Once in a while. Yeah. And what about you, Alonso? Um, that's a very difficult question, but it's also loaded, so I think no. Do you ever think about it? I've been thinking about it since I was seven. Are you afraid of dying? Not anymore. Why aren't you afraid? Um. Because that's the next stage, and my husband just died, and I've been getting signs from him, so I feel it's it's not as bad as we think it is. Do you like the Beatles? Oh, I love the Beatles. George Harrison said the most important thing in life is to seek God. Do you agree with him? I don't know if it's the most important, but it's very important. Well, he said the most important thing in life is to seek God. Do you agree with that? I'm an atheist, so you'd probably not get that from me. <laughs> and what about you? Are you an atheist? I as well, yes. Interesting shirt. What does it say? El Diablito. My girlfriend got it for me. <laughs> Do you know what made me seek after God? One thing. What? Death. That's true. It's I a good reason to seek God, because he's eternal. Yes. He has no beginning, no end. Yes. He's, the, he's the author and source of life itself. And if we want to find everlasting life, we've somehow got to find God. Do you ever read the Bible? A while ago. It's been a while. So, where do people go when they die? Some people go to heaven, and some people go with the, um... You scared to say the word hell? Hell, yeah. Where are you going? Well, I think I'm not going to heaven because I'm not doing the correct things that we're supposed to be doing. Do you really believe the scientific impossibility that nothing created everything? If you characterize it like that, I don't know. I just don't have enough to believe in one you know, higher power creating all of this. It's it's highly unlikely to me. And that's just my own personal belief. Okay, it's just easiest. <laughs> Atheism is easiest. Like Jesus was here to save us all, and you see people getting exploited and murder. God is all powerful, but yet everybody is out here getting exploited, taken advantage of. I'm just kind of cool on one religion telling me they got the answer for everything. Not saying that I have the answer, but I sure as hell don't believe they. Could you repeat no that? Could you repeat that again? But I sure as hell don't believe they 
Do you really believe? That was a big sigh, wasn't it? Yeah, I just feel like this is Am a, I annoying you? This is a, you're trying to convert. Organized religion has always caused mass war and mass atrocities. It's 6% of wars. Did you know that? It's 6% according to the Encyclopedia of Wars. Can I give you guys a gift? Can I give you a gift? For over 70% of their lifetime. What do you have to do to go to heaven? Help people be a good person. How many people do you have to help to get to heaven? 10? 100? 500? With 10 people will be good. You know, the Bible says something different. I don't read the Bible like that often, but... You should, because you know what it says? It says you don't, get to you don't get to heaven by being good. Do you know what the Bible says death actually is? No. It's wages. Really? Yeah. Romans 6.23, it says the wages of sin is death. Yeah, that means God's paying you in death for your sins. It's like a judge in a court of law looks at a heinous criminal that's murdered three girls after he raped them. He says, you've earned the death sentence. This is your wages. This is what's due to you. This is what we're going to pay you in. And sin is so serious to a holy God, he's given us the death sentence, capital punishment. Do you think you are evil enough, sinful enough, for God to put you to death for your sins? That is a good question. I would have to think about that one. But I don't think I've done anything that bad. You know how to tell if you have? How? Just look at the Ten Commandments. Oh yeah, no, I'm good. You think you're a good person? Yes. Okay, here's a test. Can you be honest with me? I'll try. <laughs> yes, I can. How many lies have you told in your life? Oh, a lot. <laughs> you ever stolen something? Yes, when I was a kid. What do you call someone who steals? I know, a thief, right? So what are you? Well, I was. A thief. A lying thief. There you go. Ah. Actually, you know, we tend to put our crimes in the past, our sins in the past, but everything we do is in the past. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yeah, sometimes. His name is holy and you've used it as a cuss word. Yeah. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes, and I, I ask for forgiveness every night. Love your mother? Yes. Would you ever use your mother's name as a cuss word? No. Why not? Because it's my mom. You'd never insult her by doing that, would you? No. But you've done it with God's name, and he gave you your mother. He gave you life and every blessing you've ever had, and his name is holy. You've actually substituted it for a four-letter filth word beginning with S to express disgust. Lisa, that's called blasphemy. It's very serious in his eyes, and you already know that. Now, Jesus said if you look with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked with lust? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you had sex before marriage? Oh, yes. Lisa, I'm not judging you. This is for you to judge yourself. This is for you to make the, the call. You've told me you're a lying thief, a blasphemer, and an adulterer at heart. If God judges you by those Ten Commandments on Judgment Day, you're going to be innocent or guilty? I'm going to be guilty. Guilty. <laughs> Heaven or hell? I say hell. Now, does that concern you? Yeah, in some way. Man, it concerns me big time. I've just met you, but I care about you. I don't want you to go to hell. So you've earned your wages. I have. So what can you do to avoid the damnation of hell? How can you be made right with God? That's, that's a good question as well. Well, it's the big question. It's what George Harrison sought after. Yeah. He devoted himself to trying to find the answer to that. It was actually right under his nose, and it's under yours too. Jesus died on the cross for the sin of the world. You've heard that? Yes. Most people have, but they don't understand this, and it can change everything. If you, if you can get a grip of this, it'll, it'll change everything for you. The Ten Commandments, that which we've just looked at, is called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. Do you remember his, la do you remember his last words on the cross? He said three very profound words. No. He said, it is finished. That's a weird thing to say as you're dying. But he was saying the debt has been paid. We broke God's law. Jesus paid the fine. It's like if you're in court, if you're in a court of law, and you've got a lot of speeding fines, the judge could say this is very serious. But someone's paid these fines. You're out of here. He can let you go if someone pays your fine, and he can still do, still do that which is legal and right and just. And God can take the death sentence off you. He can legally dismiss your case all because Jesus paid the fine in his life's blood. He can grant you everlasting life as a free gift, not because you're good, but because he's good and he's rich in mercy. And after Jesus suffered for our sins, he rose from the dead, defeated your greatest enemy, death itself. The Bible says it was not possible that death could hold him. And all you have to do to find everlasting life 
is repent of your sins. It's more than just confessing them, it's turning from sin. You can't say I'm a Christian, but you fornicate and lie and steal and blaspheme. You've got to be genuine in your repentance. And then you trust in Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. Lisa, if you're on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up, why would you put on a parachute? To live. You don't want to die. You don't want to hit the ground at 120 miles an hour. Your motivation is fear. But in that case, fear is your friend, it's not your enemy. It's causing you to put on a parachute. And what I've tried to do in, with you, and thank you for your patience, is I've tried to put the fear of God in you. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom according to the Bible. And in that case, fear is your friend, not your enemy, because it'll drive you to the mercy, it'll drive you to the mercy of God in Christ where you'll find everlasting life. You're like someone on the edge of a plane 10,000 feet up, and this is your plan. You're going to flap your arms and try and save yourself when you jump. I say, don't do that. Trust the parachute. It's as simple as that. Don't trust yourself. Trust the parachute. And so don't trust your goodness to save you on Judgment Day. Trust the Savior. Transfer your, your faith from yourself to the Savior. Is this making sense? Yep, it is. You're going to think about what we talked about? I am. You're going to repent and trust Christ? I'm going to. Can I pray with you? Sure. Father, I thank you for Lisa. I thank you for her open heart and her honesty in admitting her sins. And I, I pray today she'll understand your love expressed in the cross and find a place of genuine repentance and faith in Jesus and pass from death to life because of your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I got a gift for you, okay? Oh, yeah. A couple of gifts. Okay. This is a book I wrote called The Beatles God and the Bible. Okay. And you're a Beatles fan. I am. This is um, how to be free from the fear of death, and it'll really help you grow in your faith. Thank you. Okay. I'm always, you know, talking with God when I'm alone and telling Him I'm sorry, you know, for doing this during the day, during the night. Well, maybe today God's answered your prayers by me sharing the gospel with you on how to be saved. You repent and trust alone in Jesus. And the minute you do that, you've got God's promise. He'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift. And the Bible says God cannot lie, he's without sin, so you can trust him with all your heart. When he says it, he means it, he'll keep his promise. He'll grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Do you believe what I'm saying? Yes. You're going to think about what we talked about? Yes. You're going, so you're to, going repent. to repent and trust in Jesus? Yes. Okay, can I pray for you? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Father, I pray for Nancy. Thank you for her open heart. I pray she'll think about her secret sins and how serious sin is in your eyes. And today, repent and trust alone in Jesus and be born again with a new heart and new desires, all because of your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you have a Bible at home? Yeah. Can I give you a gift real quick? Yes. Okay. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell and make sure you don't miss the Living Waters podcast. If you want to grow in your faith, we highly recommend the School of Biblical Evangelism textbook. This is the entire School of Biblical Evangelism in written form, filled to the brim with apologetic scientific facts in the Bible, atheism, different religions, cults, everything you could ever want to know about evangelism, over 700 pages, authored by myself, Kurt Cameron, and my good friend and gifted apologist, Mark Spence, available at livingwaters.com.